this concept of fake news kind of is happening everywhere. And the CDC released this report last year that really kind of tipped me off and I was really confused about it. <laughs> And it doesn't matter, like every, pretty much every media outlet station picked up this thing and they picked up these buzzwords and they, they just put it out there without actually looking at and breaking down that study. And what it, the study said was that tick-borne diseases and mosquito-borne diseases, vector-borne diseases have tripled in the past, you know, since 2004 from, to 2016. And it just was shocking. And these newspapers picked it up and they're like, mosquitoes and ticks are tripling, all this you know, catastrophe. Like I said, the end is near. But when you look at the study, what they, what they did is they very conveniently kind of cherry picked their data. They stopped that study in 2016. And this was the first year that Zika was reported in the United States. And so you see this, you get nothing, nothing, and then the massive spike in 2016. And if you follow that out to 2017, 2018, it drops down to back down. And so, what we see a lot of times with mosquito-borne diseases is that they are not tripling by any means whatsoever. They stay relatively steady, uh, especially when you pull out the Zika. And mosquitoes do that. They kind of go up and down and up and down, but they're not on this dramatic increase. On the other hand, you've got tick-borne diseases. And shame on the media, in, in my opinion, for not really highlighting this, but tick-borne diseases are making up the bulk of all vector-borne diseases in the country. So you look at these, you know, close to 80-90% of all vector-borne diseases. In 2016, clearly Zika made up a large chunk of that. But if you pull out Zika, you know, 81% of all the diseases were tick-borne diseases. And another thing about Zika is that of the, of the 40, almost 42,000 cases of Zika, 37,000 were, were in places like Puerto Rico, not in the United States. And they just kind of pulled that in there uh, I don't know why. I think this is a very flawed study, in my opinion. Um, but we see data from, from Massachusetts, and this comes from MDPH, where Lyme disease, you know, starting back in 1990, has been on this steady upward trend. And some years are lower than others. Uh, last year was lower than others. But it, still, when you look at this, that's much, much higher than down here. And these bars down here, this is anaplasmosis and babesiosis. These are two other tick-borne diseases that are nationally reportable, and they're kind of seeing the same pattern. We don't know if it's going to continue on this trajectory. There's not enough data yet to really make that decision, but it certainly looks like it. So all this data that's collected is based on this stuff, on these very well-defined definitions that the CDC puts forth. Um, and what they determine is that there are 30,000 cases of Lyme disease per year. It kind of sounds like a big number, but when you think there's 325 million people in the US, that's only 0.009% of the population. That's crazy to me. Yeah, there's um, yeah, close to half a million in Plymouth County. Uh, and so it's, it's just nuts to me. So, you know, I mean, when you ask people, they say things like, I've had Lyme disease, my kids had it, my dog has it. <laughs> Something is wrong with this situation. Like, what, what CDC, what are you doing? Um, and then they looked into this and they kind of confessed. They were like, all right, you know, we may be underestimating the number of cases. So they kind of threw out a number and they said, well, maybe it's 10 times that number. So maybe 300,000 cases. But if you speak with people like, like doctors that are, have been diagnosing Lyme for, for since it, basically for decades and people have experienced it, they'll say, this number is still low. Some of them, they, they don't know if it's 400,000, 500,000, a million. They don't know where that stops. You know, they, they don't know how high it goes. They just know that this is still a gross underestimation of the number of cases that are actually occurring. And these cases may, may not seem like that much, but they're very concentrated in two, very, in two locations, kind of at home and then a little bit in the upper Midwest. But you look at this, and this is a little, you can still see the speckles. This is almost completely blue. Um, and this was 2001, and then it fans out to 2015. So it stays relatively concentrated here. Um, the only state that we have not had a case of Lyme in yet has been Hawaii, but we've had it as far up as Alaska. So even in Alaska, we still see cases of Lyme crop up. Um, so how bad is it actually? What are the numbers? So we like to give these facts in terms of incidence rate, and so that's a number out of 100,000. So in 2014, uh, I like to compare apples to apples. Last time, the, this is the last data I have where I can do that. Um, the U.S. incidence rate was 7.9. Uh, and when you look at the state ranking, you know, you've got Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, you know, all these, they're really tight, you know, Maine and Vermont. You don't ever want to say, well, we're not as bad as those guys. We're all pretty bad. You know, we're, we're over five times 
the national incidence rate. That's pretty substantial. But wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, so Plymouth County, so what we see is that the, the, the national average, 7.9, it jumps up when you get into Massachusetts at 54. And then all these numbers jumped up again. And Plymouth is at 109, so it doubles. Because there are areas in Massachusetts that are actually dragging that state average down, that are dragging that 54 down. And then Plymouth, we got to come to the rescue and boost that, that average back up. Um, so Plymouth County is pretty high. I mean, like I said, we're not as bad, maybe not as bad as Nantucket and Dukes, still pretty bad. And then you have down here Barnstable, like we were discussing earlier, where Barnstable's average, Barnstable used to be third, and now Barnstable's kind of holding steady at this, and every other county has been moving up. So in my opinion, this is kind of how the CDC is looking at it. You know, they, they call high incidence is 10 and up, but that national average is 7.9. So it's like the, the fire is going on in the basement, but the smoke detector is not doing anything because it's not at that 10 yet. Meanwhile, here in Massachusetts, we're well above that high incidence rate. So Lyme disease is still one of the biggest things that comes up. And we know a lot about Lyme. For instance, it's not caused by too many coronas. I certainly would have gotten it by now. Um, it's, it's caused by a spirochete bacteria. It's not a government conspiracy that comes up every now and then. We trace the DNA of Lyme back at least 20,000 years ago, and maybe the most recent ancestor of Lyme existed 60,000 years ago, back to the last glacial maximum. So this thing has been here for, since the Ice Age, it's, which is wild. We know about how it's passed around in the wild, but there's still a lot of questions. For instance, is it completely curable? How many strains are there exactly? Is there permanent damage that this bacteria, when it gets into our bodies, can cause? There's a lot of unknowns. You know, are we treating it properly? What about new diagnostic techniques? We, right now, we're, we're learning a lot. But even with this science, someone might come up with something tomorrow. But then by the time we kind of analyze that and follow up on it, it might be years before we actually can base a conclusion off of that. Um, and it's not just Lyme. So Lyme is still number one. It's still the most common tick-borne disease. But here in Massachusetts, you've got nine other diseases that you can potentially get. And it's counting. Um, so, and this is just for Massachusetts. You know, in other parts of the country, you know, you look at, you know, Wisconsin. They have their own set of diseases that are different from this. And you look at uh, places like uh, Tennessee, again, you've got different diseases, the heartland virus, bourbon virus. We don't have that here, but we have the same tick species that are passing that around down in Tennessee and Wisconsin. They are here. It's just those diseases aren't here yet. So we still don't, you know, this, this, this list is still growing is, is really the take home for that. Uh, what is this thing, alpha-gal allergy? So this is spread. This is a, one, an allergy that's transmitted by this, it's called a lone star tick. And it gets its name from this spot. So it's not a feminist superhero, despite the name Alpha Gal. It's actually what we call the allergy to red meat. That's what you might have heard about in the papers. But I like to call it more the mammalian meat allergy because it affects things just beyond red meat. So I, I still like my steak and burgers, but I eat a lot more. This, a bite from this tick would make me allergic to a lot more than just steak and burgers. I mean, you're, you're thinking of things like bacon, you know, pulled pork. Um, even things like gummy bears because they contain gelatin or even things like ice cream because ice cream is a dairy product. So this alpha-gal, this carbohydrate is present in a lot of products that come from mammals. And so when you think about that, how many things come from mammals is pretty much everything. I mean, you'd be really resigned to eating like broccoli or fish and chicken. Um, Swedish fish don't have gelatin, so you could eat Swedish fish, but I love my gummy bears, so it'd be awful for me. Um, and then we have this new tick that you might have heard about too. It's called the longhorn tick. So this was a tick that they found had made it into the United States from Asia. And uh, they discovered it in 2017, but they think it's been here since 2010, just kind of being out and about. Um, it can reproduce asexually. So I like to call these <laughs> strong, independent women. Um, but each generation still takes a year. So one of the things I like to clarify with this tick is people, the first thing you see is it spreads rapidly, it takes over, but the generations still take a long time. So while it only takes one tick going from one location to the next, it's still gonna take a while to quote unquote infest an area. It's not this thing that's gonna just rapidly breed, almost like you might find a, like, a, like you see in a horror movie. Like, it, it's not like that. Uh, and it's cold tolerant. So really what we're seeing is that while well, we found it in New Jersey and you know, Arkansas and down here, we, it's really only a matter of time before it makes its way into Massachusetts. So don't 
really be shocked when you start hearing about this in the papers that this tick has made it here. It's not anything shocking to me. In fact, they, they even project it up into you know, Maine and Nova Scotia in that, in that area. So it should make it well past Massachusetts. So what's causing this? So very, very complicated. All, you know, there's a lot of different factors at play between things that are happening in the environment, things that are happening on the medical end, things that are happening culturally. It, it's, very, it's a very complicated situation. So one of the things people like to bring up is, is it just being diagnosed more? So incidence rates goes up. Is it just because doctors are more aware? Is the, is the technology to diagnose these diseases just improving? You know, what's actually going on? We think that this is one piece of that puzzle. Um, is the risk of disease higher? Are there more ticks? Are, there, are the ticks becoming more infected? And we think that this is, again, is another piece of that puzzle. We do think that the ticks, the, particularly this deer tick or black-legged tick, it, it has been kind of increasing in number. And here in Massachusetts, this particular organism is about 50% you know, infected with Lyme as an adult. So we do think infection rates kind of are pretty high for this as well. Um, so it's called the deer tick. What about the deer? This is what everyone wants to know. This is always the million dollar question. We didn't have deer back in the day. We didn't have deer tick back in the day. People kind of do this own science in their head and they think, oh, it must be the deer that are causing that. Well, the deer are a very important reproductive host. That, there's no doubt about it. They love deer. But what I like to tell people is my, my niece, she's about three. She's the mac and cheese girl, I call her that. But if I take away mac and cheese, She's going to eat the chicken nuggets, the french fries, the steak, the broccoli. And this is how this deer tick acts. While it does like deer, it does not need the deer. And we see this by, by experiments we've done on islands. So attempts to, to kind of cull deer and eradicate deer, they've worked on islands in reducing tick populations, but they've never worked once in mainland areas. And these studies on islands didn't actually eradicate the ticks. The ticks were still there. Deer were extinct. Ticks were still there, but the ticks did have a drop in the population, a pretty significant drop at that. Um, so what we think, though, is uh, one weird thing that's come out of these studies is that we think there might be maybe a minimum threshold for these deer. So if you removed, say, 50% of the deer in Massachusetts, you would not see any drop in the number of ticks in Massachusetts. You would see almost nothing. Uh, because what they saw in these islands is they reduced, they had one island, they reduced it down to two deer on the entire island, and they didn't see a drop in the number of ticks. They saw they, the ticks went from being 12 per deer to f over 50 per deer. So they got more ticks on just fewer deer. And then it wasn't until they eliminated those last two deer that they saw that drop in the number of ticks. So this is what we're seeing. We're seeing like you might need to bring these deer down to almost near extinction to see a drop in the number of ticks, which is, was very shocking to me. Um, and then preventing immigration, are you really going to do that in Massachusetts, prevent any deer from moving into Massachusetts? I mean, you'd be looking at maybe a full northeastern program of erratic, making deer extinct. It's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> and on that, people have tried that, actually. People have tried deer fencing, and that actually works on uh, properties that are greater than 7.4 hectares. So you're looking at maybe around 14, 15 acres. You can actually build a wall and keep the deer out, and that will cause a reduction in the number of ticks in that particular property. So not all animals that get bit by ticks are capable, are, are going to get sick. A deer, for instance, is not capable of getting Lyme disease. So and if, if a tick, an adult tick, bites that deer, that deer will come off, that tick will come off that deer and not be infectious with Lyme disease at all. It actually cleans it out from, with Lyme disease. Um, but the mice, on the other hand, are kind of these almost like typhoid marys that are picking up the spirochete, harboring that disease for a long time, and then passing it on to all other ticks that feed on it. So we think this mice might be a, an important factor in this. But you know, there's also chipmunk shrews, voles, and robins. And what the literature is calling these is rescue hosts. Because if you eliminate the mice, then these kind of come in and rescue that disease back. That if you were to eliminate all these mice, the presence of these animals would sustain that level of disease in the environment. So w one of the weird things that we found is that risk tends to be higher in suburban communities, not places like rural Massachusetts or suburban Massachusetts, but suburban communities much like Hingham uh, or Norwell or Situate, those kinds of areas. Um, and what we're seeing, what, the reason we're seeing this is that the, the animals that like these kinds of habitats 
that like these kind of fragmented habitats where you have like trees and then how and then the edges nestled in, um, that you get more of those things like the mice, chipmunks, shrews, and voles and robins, and you get fewer things like fewer foxes and fewer bobcats. Like I lived in Massachusetts my whole life. I've never seen a bobcat, but if you have bobcats, supposedly you have fewer ticks because the bobcats are really good at eating things like the things that are spreading disease, keeping those populations down, and therefore the ticks down as well. So um, by building our perfect communities, we're kind of bringing this on ourselves. That's the thought behind this. But again, this research is still new, um, and we're still waiting to see more. But incidence rate in Massachusetts kind of reflects this. I mean, you look at places, like I said, like maybe the suburban areas of Massachusetts, over here in Western Mass and down here, not so bad, uh, particularly Boston urban, not so bad. Um, but areas that are starting to become more developed, we see this rise. Um, what's the other reason, you know, tick-borne diseases are increasing? Is that what are we doing? Like, what we're, all this stuff is changing. Our environment's changing. You know, ticks are getting worse. What are we actually doing? We're just kind of sitting here saying, what are, what are they going to do about it? You know, what is the government going to do about it? What is the scientists going to do about it? What are the doctors going to do about it? When really, uh, when, if we really want to stop this and stop waiting on other people to fix our problems, it's going to take a lot on our part to kind of fix this, fix this for ourselves until the, the other guys can get that nailed down. So there are tools, and these tools have existed since about the 80s. They've existed for a very long time, since even basically prior, since the discovery of Lyme, these tools have existed to get rid of ticks. And I use them, so I do a lot of stuff outside. I feel like New England is one of the most beautiful parts of this country. I do a lot of camping, I do a lot of hiking, I do a lot of fishing. I love getting out there and I go out, I have fun and I'm not nervous when I go out there because in my opinion, if you're going out on a hike, you're doing it to relax. Uh, and I just enjoy myself. And uh, this is me out fishing, I love fly fishing and I'm surrounded by tick habitat. And I don't worry about ticks, I just have fun and I just live my life and I, I, I'm happy. Um, so it's all about being aware of ticks and not being afraid. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that makes us, the reason, the how ticks make us sick and what protection methods we can use to kind of stop that and use basically science to protect ourselves. Um, so how ticks make us sick is that you can't, you, don't, basically, you only get sick from a tick bite. So you're not gonna get sick from just having a tick walk on you or anything like that, it has to bite. So when a tick bites, first thing it's gonna do is locate a tasty spot on your body. It's not always the first place that the tick sees. Sometimes they like to find certain spots on our bodies, maybe behind our, our head, our armpits, or maybe a, a spot where there's a creep where we, they find like a barrier, like maybe it'll crawl up until it hits my belt and it can't get past that, so it'll bite me in the waist. But they don't feed like mosquitoes. They wanna do something, they wanna create what we call a feeding lesion under our skin. So a mosquito kind of bites and then it's off. These ticks wanna essentially create this wound open wound underneath our skin and feed from that for a very long period of time. So the first thing this tick's gonna do is secrete a cement, and that cement's gonna solidify that tick in place. The next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna spit into your body. And I know that's really gross, but this spit has lots of things that, that are in it. You've got anticoagulants so that, that wound doesn't clot. You've got immunosuppressive agents so your body can't detect it. You've got vasodilators to promote blood flow to that site. You've got so many things, and this tick, this tiny little organism is doing all that to us, to our bodies. It's just unbelievable. Um, but it doesn't just spit once. Over the next four days to a week, it will spit and suck and spit and suck and spit and suck constantly. And if you don't like when someone does that to your drink, you really don't want a tick doing that to your body. This is how you get sick, is with that spitting and sucking is, is how these organisms make it into our bodies. And they even take advantage of those things like the immunosuppressive agents. So knocking down our immune system so these bacteria can move in and colonize. So this 24 hour rule, have you heard about that? If you get a tick off in 24 hours, you're safe. If you don't, then. So what we find, the only real thing that I've ever seen in any of the literature is that risk, risk of transmission increases over time. I've never seen this thing, this 24 hour rule. There's actually, it's based on flawed data actually. Um, so again, it's not like Cinderella or the stroke of midnight, 24 hours, then you have Lyme, and then 23 hour, hours and 59 minutes, you don't. Uh, 
there's really not that much data at all. A lot of the studies are based on rodent models and not humans. In some of the human clinical cases, they've seen Lyme transmitted in under 24 hours. And in many of these studies, they start with the 24 hour mark. So we don't know what happens at 23 hours, 22 hours, 19 hours, we don't know. And at 24 hours, what they find is that you get about six to 16% infection. That to me doesn't mean that you're safe after 24 hours. That tells me that you're, you're getting this before 24 hours. Um, and sometimes the interview interval is like 12. So they'll go from 12 hours where they'll have nothing, 24 hours you have 10% 10, 10 of the people have Lyme. What happens between 12 and 24? I don't know, and there's really no data on that. And it doesn't include a lot of other diseases. So the 24 hour rule is in particular, uh, particularly pertains to Lyme disease, but not Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which transmits in about 10 to 20 hours, Powassan virus, which is 15 minutes, and alpha-gal allergy, which we don't know. Um, and so this 24 hour rule is kind of one of those things where if you're relying on that to stay safe, um, I don't know, it's kind of a gamble in my opinion. Um, but the big thing is you can't get sick if you don't get bit. So there's a lot of things to keep these ticks off our body in the first place. And I really like those things. Those things make me happy. Um, so not locking myself inside, um, learning to keep ticks off my body. So the big thing is that ticks dry out really fast, super fast. If I brought a tick inside on a day like this, put it down on the carpet, it would be dead in 24 hours. It cannot survive. Uh, under this type of humidity. They need 82% or higher, uh, really around 90% and higher is what they really like. You'll still get mortality at 82%. So they really like it very humid, very damp. And so things like shrubs, you know, inside logs, leaves, uh, areas that harbor moisture, that's where you're gonna tend to find ticks. Um, and one study found that 88% of ticks are about less than three meters, so you think like maybe around nine feet from the edge of a woods. So they're not gonna, you're not going to find them on the center of a soccer field, but along the edges of a soccer field, that's where you're going to find them. Um, they really like that. And what they found is that the nymph stage ticks, the teenager stage, is even tighter, closer to the woods and more in the woods. And the adults are the ones that wander a little bit further from the woods, around the, the three meter range. So you can keep ticks off your lawn. So a lawn like this, that beautiful lawn like that, I would never find a tick on this. You're not going to find ticks on a lawn like this. So you can keep your, your yard looking like that. My yard doesn't look like that. I've got leaves and stuff everywhere, but do as I say, not as I do. Uh, and then this, you know, moving the, 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 goal, the net away from the yard. So if you kick the soccer ball, it, it's not, you don't have kids running out and picking the soccer ball, then coming back and doing the overhead throw with the tick saw on the soccer ball. You don't want that. Um, you can also do something called a perimeter yard spray. And a lot of people find this contentious because nowadays we're living in a world where everyone wants all natural organic, that kind of thing. But if you're really serious about keeping ticks off your lawn, this is really solid advice to give. Um, it, you want to use a synthetic, so you want bifenthrin or Talstar, and this you're going to have to hire someone to spray. But you only, want to, you only really need to spray once or twice in the entire year. That's how good this stuff is. It, it's not going to bioaccumulate. If you've got chickens or birds and they come eat the ticks, it doesn't bioaccumulate in animals. You want to avoid wetlands, though, because it can have some pretty negative effects on aquatic life. Um, but you want to spray early May, because this is when those nymphs, nymphs come out, is early May. And you can spray early June, because that's when the eggs are going to hatch into larva. So you're basically targeting these stages of ticks. Or you can do an optional spray in the fall, and this is where you target the adults. So these nymphs will become adults, and they'll come out in September. Um, and they'll last through the winter. So these adult stage ticks that you see now, those are actually 2018 ticks. So they, they just stay active through, through that winter. So just having these sprays done, you know, one, two, three, you, they've actually shown that you can reduce ticks 90 to 100% in your yard. In most cases, it's, it's really around the 100% mark that you reduce ticks in your yard. They're very, very effective. Um, tick tubes, these, these things are, again, people like them. They're kind of a DIY, do-it-yourself kind of thing. You can take a toilet paper roll. You can treat it with that same stuff that they'd spray in your yard, but stick it inside this, this tube. Um, unfortunately, they're not reliable control. Um, one guy ran one study. They worked. Tom Mather, Dr. Mather, he's a great scientist. But they tried to replicate this. And one of the important things about studies is that you need to be able to replicate it. And they could not. They had two, two really big studies that span across multiple states that took, took place over multiple years, 
and they could not replicate the same effect that that guy, Dr. Mather, got. They, they didn't even get close. In some cases, the ticks got worse. And it didn't really, they didn't get worse, it's just random variation. But they essentially came to the conclusion that these these tubes, for the most part, do nothing for your yard. They're just kind of like a lucky rabbit's foot and Tom Mather. It was lucky for him on that day, and uh, they worked in whatever area of the country he was doing. It was Massachusetts, but they worked for him there. Um, so what if you go outside your yard? So that's good protection for your yard, the yard spray, cleaning up your yard. But what if you're like me? What if you like to do a lot of hiking, a lot of stuff outside, you like to go birding or look at butterflies or something? Um, Step one, you can cover up. And I, people hate this because they're like, I want to be able to do more. But this is still an important part, is creating that physical barrier to keep ticks off your body. Um, so even in the winter, still kind of cover up. But sometimes I, I walk into the city, I see some women, and they're wearing short skirts. And I'm like, how do you do that? But uh, at least they're in the city, and they're not walking, and they're not going hiking. Um, but yeah, ticks are still active. I mean, the black-legged tick's got a two-year life cycle. It synthesizes glycerol, historically used as antifreeze. So it, this organism is making antifreeze to keep itself from freezing. And it actually burrow under things like leaves and snow to kind of keep that, those cold, frigid temperatures. When we get down to like the minus two, minus seven, it, it's actually warmer underneath these leaves and snow because you don't get the wind chill and things like that. Um, so this organism is well adapted to life in New England. The cold winter is not going to have a noticeable impact on the ticks whatsoever. But season kind of does matter in a way. So in April to September, so coming up now, you've got the nymphs. They're going to start becoming active. And you'll find them deep in the leaf litter, really. On an average, 1.2 1, 1 inches off the ground, you think like that's ankle height and below. That's where you find these nymph stage ticks. Uh, when we get into September, like fall, and throughout the winter until May, you get the adults are at, the adults are active, and they actually are a little bit more risky. They'll do this thing called questing, where they'll climb to the top of a really long either blade of grass or cat briar or even a twig that's sticking up out of the ground, and they're looking to hitch a ride on a larger animal. So uh, that's why you know they like the deer. So when the deer are kind of running through the woods, they're kind of hanging up higher up to latch onto the to the bigger animal, versus here you know, 1.2 inches off the ground, they're looking to latch onto things like mice and chipmunks running through the leaves. Um, but the adults, you can find up to two and a half feet off the ground. So when you think about September through May, you know, pants are probably a good idea instead of shorts because two and a half feet down, that's like waist down, you gotta think. Um, and then you have this thing, tucking your pants into your socks, this really nerdy thing. Um, and I do this when, when I go camping um, because see this, see this gap right here? Um, you got this nice gap between your legs, and sometimes ticks, they, they, they find that gap and they crawl up, and they don't stop right away all the time. Sometimes they keep going all the way to places that only your doctor should have access to. <laughs> and last thing I want to do when I'm out with my buddies for a weekend of fishing is find a tick somewhere that I don't want them seeing and ask them to remove it for me. That ain't, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna, I'm gonna stuck with that tick until I get home. Um, so that's why I do that. They make fun of me, but I catch bigger fish than them, so whatever. Um, and so covering up, it only gets you so far, and these are ticks covered on this person's khakis. Um, what if you could do more? What if you could do more than cover up? So you can. There's this stuff called permethrin, and this is the only thing we have on the market that will repel ticks and also kill them. So you're D, you're off. That's not going to kill the ticks. But this permethrin or permethrin, tomato, tomato, this is gonna actually kill any ticks that attach to you, and it will do so very, very quickly. Uh, it's very, very effective. Um, so how do you use it? You apply it to clothing and shoes only, so never your skin. It's not gonna really kill you. It's just my custom skin irritation. It's just not gonna work on your skin. It needs to bind, it needs fabric to bind to. That's the way it works. You wait for it to dry, usually about two to four hours, you, but you want it to be dry. You don't say like, oh, Blake told me you'd be done after four hours, and you go out and put the wet stuff on. It's not gonna work. Uh, and it lasts through six washings or one month. So starting you know, right around now, you know, or maybe even April, what I do is I just treat my clothes every month that I'm going to go hiking in. And I don't keep track. You know, I never wash my clothes more than six times in one month. And I, that's all I do. I just follow that through. If you are someone that doesn't like this kind of regimen, they actually sell clothing that is pre-treated with this stuff that's good for 70 washings. So you can, and you know, that's particular, that's good. I, I met a woman, she has kids, and she knows that the kids aren't going to do this all the time. So she just treats her kids with that stuff that's good for 70 washings, or she buys it. 
and she doesn't even have to worry. They just grab some clothes out of the drawer, put the clothes on, and she has peace of mind knowing that they're wearing the stuff that's good for 70 washings. So when they go out to their summer camps and they go out and they play, that they're protected from ticks with this stuff. Is it safe? So a lot of times people say, like, it's killing ticks. What does it do to me? Well, I'm not a tick. I'm much bigger than a tick, and I'm not an arthropod. So it's, gonna affect, it's not going to affect me in the same way that it affects ticks. Um, this thing is safe for infants, toddlers, and children. It's also safe for pregnant nursing mothers. And you want to keep cats away from it, but once it's dry, it's safe after. So this is me, and this is my cat. Um, these, are my, these are my pants that I go out looking for ticks in. Uh, that is another part of my job. And she's sitting on that. You know, She licks her fur while she's sitting on my lap. She's A-OK. -okay, but I always wait for this stuff to dry. So what about anything not protected with permethrin? So in the summer, we don't want to be wearing what I'm wearing. We want to be wearing shorts, sandals, that kind of thing. So there are going to, and what if you forget? What if you're out with your friends and you forget to, so there are some things you can do in lieu of permethrin. Um, we, the ticks detect us in a special way. They do so using these things called Haller's organs. And they're located on the end of each of these legs. So whenever you see these ticks, they kind of look like they're, um, kind of at partying, kind of going all out at, this, at, a, at a rave. Uh, they're actually sensing their environment. And they're picking up on things like CO2, the level of CO2 as we approach them. They can actually detect that. Body odors, sweat. And these, these organs can actually, in a weird way, smell. They can smell body heat. So they can actually detect a warm body moving toward it using these Haller's organs. Uh, so EPA register repellents is a mouthful they'll actually block those up. And what is an EPA-registered repellent? This is uh, things like DEET, picaridin, oil of almond eucalyptus, and this thing, 3-N-butyl N-acetyl aminopropionic acid ethyl ester. Or IR-3535. Or another name for it is Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard. So if you know an Avon representative, you can go with this. Um, it's EPA-registered. It comes with this EPA registration number down here, and you can always see it if it's a product is EPA registered. That means that if the bottle says this, this repels ticks for four hours, that there is an actual study backing that up, that they actually have data to back up this repels ticks for X amount of time, this repels mosquitoes for X amount of time, that, that that's what that means. Um, for, for products, how much do you need? So they sell all kinds of products, 100% DEET, 50% DEET. People think more is better and ticks are so scary, why not go with the 100%? Well, a lot of the issues of DEET toxicity have arisen because someone has gotten their hands on a bottle of 100% DEET and drank it or you know, a child or, or something, and that's bad, that's really bad. You'd only need 20% or more DEET for it to be effective on ticks, that's it. I mean, you can use 30%, with higher percentages, it'll last a little bit longer, but it won't repel more ticks. 20% or more, that's all you need. Um, for this oil of lemon eucalyptus, 30% or more. And so you don't need 100%. And what about your pets? So protection for your pets, very important. I love my cat. I'm sure you, if you guys have pets, I'm sure you love your pets just like you'd love your, your, your children. Um, and what do they do? You know, they like to play in the leaves, and then they like to do this, right? And what happens if there's ticks on this? Well, they don't necessarily bite right away. Sometimes, especially a dog like this with long fur, sometimes they'll groom them off. Sometimes the ticks will come off on them. And then the ticks end up in our bed. And while it won't live for 24 hours, like I said, in a, in a you know, 24 hour, you know, a few hours might be long enough for us to cuddle that dog or lay down next to it and for that tick to actually bite us. And once it's bitten us, it's gonna get all the moisture it needs from our blood. Um, so, Getting proper protection on your pets, there, there should be no reason why you'd have a lapse in that protection. Um, proper treatment is really important to speak with your veterinarian about this. So you've got two products, and they look kind of the same. I mean, this is called something something A Advantix 2 and then Advantage 2. They kind of have the same name. You know, these two things, they both kind of look like cats. So I might make that mistake, you know. But if I were to take this product here and put this on a cat, I could... I would probably kill that cat. It's, it's that dangerous. So you really need to be careful about what you're putting on your animals. Um, and dogs, you can actually vaccinate dogs against Lyme. So you could actually do that, and that would help your dog not contract Lyme. Oh, what about these all-natural products? So a lot, of, like I said, a lot of times people want to talk about all-natural stuff. Um, they're 25B exempt. 
Uh, what that means is that the EPA, so the same organization that people don't trust to say that DEET's okay, they're going to trust to say these all natural products are okay. And what 25B exempt means is that they don't require anything for safety or efficacy. It's just saying, no, if you find these things work, then whatever, sell them. That's, that's what they are. There's no studies done. And there's very limited scientific data on these. So use at your own risk. Uh, and what they found is um, this person, Dr. Tina Wismer, um, she's the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center's director. She said essential oils are the top reason for calls to that animal ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center for tick-related concerns. So people are misusing these products. If you want to use it, use at your own risk. I can't stop you. I'd rather you use something than nothing, but I don't really recommend using these. <laughs> um, so no protection is 100%. You know, if, you were to, if I were to spray my, all my clothes you know, with permethrin, I'm getting really close to 99%, 99 and above percent, but it's still not 100%. There's always a chance that you could get a tick in some way. Um, so tick checks kind of are that safety net that we have. And frequent check, tick checks are important because if you look at this, you know, if you've got a lot of freckles on your back or anything like that, you want to get used to what this looks like and if it changes. If there's another new freckle, then you know, like, hey, maybe there's a tick there. And if your vision isn't so good, try using your fingertips um, because sometimes your fingertips are more sensitive than your vision. Um, pets, of course, you want to do, do tick checks on your pet. Um, the key is often. So remember we were talking about that 24-hour rule? The key is just catching these things before because we know that risk increases with time. Catching a tick very quickly is really important and not relying on yourself to just know. I talked to some people and they're like, well, I would know. So they ran one study in 1995 and they found that 10% of nymphs were removed in the first 24 hours just by people. So only 10% of the population was catching these things before that 24 hours. And then 87% were removed after five days. So people, so 13% of our population had ticks on their body for five days without them noticing it. And nymphs feed for about five to six days. So it's not shocking to me when people say that I've had Lyme disease and I didn't remember a tick. You know, you might be part of that 13% that never noticed it after the five days. Maybe. These things are very sneaky. They don't want to be detected. So what are you, what are you looking for in a tick check? Uh, well, the nymphs that are going to start becoming active in April, they're about the size of a poppy seed. And I have some examples over here if you want to see. So they're really small. So like I said, if your vision isn't so good, try using your fingertips. The adults come out in the fall, and these are a little bit easier to see. They're about the size of a sesame seed. So these are the ones that we can see a little bit easier. They've actually found that most of the cases of tick-borne disease are attributed to these nymph stage ticks. People are more active in the summer. They're smaller. And so even though they, they only carry Lyme disease 25% of the time as opposed to the 50%, we don't see these as often. What do you do if you find a tick? Step one, you don't <laughs> panic. <laughs> um, so ticks suck, so they really do. Uh, you've got these things called palps, and we're going to talk about how a tick bites because this is kind of play into how you would want to remove a tick. Um, so the palps, these are, these are the organs you see here. These aren't really involved in the whole biting process. They're sensory organs. These things are called chelicerae, and these are cutting organs. So the tick is going to use these to make an incision into our skin. But it's this organ here that the tick is going to feed through. It's called a hypostome. And it's covered in these barbs. But the tick is only ever going to put this part into your body. That's it. This is the only part that enters your body is just that hypostome. Sometimes people call it the head. It's, it's really just a long feeding straw. I mean, you can see it in here, too. So this is a tick biting skin. You can see how the palps kind of spoil to the side. But the only thing that goes in is that hypostome. That's it. Um, so what you want to do, the best way to remove ticks is, is just simple, use tweezers. I, when I got into this, I was looking up all the kinds of things like Vaseline, nail polish remover, matches, all these things. What they found in those studies is that those things either don't remove the tick quick enough or they might actually cause the tick to spit. And you know how I was saying the spitting and sucking is what's involved in the disease, the disease transmission? The last thing you want is a tick to spit more into your body. Uh, you don't want that to happen. They don't know if that causes increased disease transmission, but it seems kind of like, kind of likely. Uh, I don't know. Um, but by pulling the tick out with tweezers, you're not you're going to avoid that. Um, so you want to firmly grasp it, and you want to grasp this part here. That's called the scutum. 
it means shield. It's a really hard part of the tick. And that's even though, even though the tick looks like this, pretty deep, still the only part that's actually under your skin is that hypostome. Your skin can kind of sometimes swell up over that body, but you want to grab as close to the skin and grab it right around that scutum, and then you want to pull straight up. And you don't want to twist or jerk or yank. I know you really want to get that thing off as quick as possible, but it's slow and steady pressure is really going to get that off. Uh, and sometimes that, that hypostome can break off. You know, I told you it's got cement, it's got those barbs. You know, something's got to give. Either it's going to be your skin, or the tick hypostome is going to break off, or the barbs are going to tear up your skin, or the cement's going to give. So if that, if that hypostome breaks off, you don't actually need to dig that out. Some people say you got to get that out. Even some medical doctors say you got to get it out. But what they found is that there's no real increased risk. It's not going to continue. The disease is inside the body of the tick. So once you get that tick body off, that hypostome doesn't continually pump in disease. If disease is in that mouth part, whatever's in there, it's, it's just in there and that, that's, that's all there is to it. But it's, it's not going to up your risk of disease by leaving that in there. It's going to be a little bit like a splinter at that point. And so you want to apply some antiseptic to that to avoid secondary infection. But you can, you can actually leave that in there and let your body work that out. After you remove a tick, uh, so growing up, my dad, uh, he was a carpenter. And I used to come to him if I had a tick and he'd put it on his workbench and he'd come over and hit it with a hammer. And I still think that's the most masculine way to kill a tick. But I'm going to tell you to do the opposite. I know most people, they flush the tick down the toilet. But I'm going to actually ask you to save the tick. And the reason you want to do this, um, and how, you, how you're going to do this, sorry, is you want to bag it and then date it. And date it, but write the date on it. And so why you want to do this is because tick-borne disease, like I said, there's still a lot of unknowns. And so building your own case is really important. After you have that tick bite, after that happens, you're like, oh shoot. You get that tick off and you're like, okay, now what do I do? Is there anything more I can do to help my case? Having a date tied to that and having that specimen on hand helps build your case. So if you were to go to your doctor and you say, doc, I think I have Lyme disease. I think I meet all the symptoms. And your doctor says, no, I, I don't think you're right. No, no, I, I'm a doctor, no. Um, then you can take this still bring it to another doctor. And you have that evidence, you have the date of the tick bite, you can follow your symptoms, you know, one month, two months down the road, knowing that instead of saying, well, I think I was bit in October, I, I don't know, then your doctor's gonna be like, well, if you don't really know, they can't trust that. It's not that they're bad. I, how can you trust someone if they're like, I think this, or I, but if you have that firm, you have that date written down, then they can actually know that for sure. That's an actual fact that they can rely on. And, by saving the tick, it's because species actually matters. The species of tick, not all ticks can transmit all diseases. Species makes a difference. So you have here Lyme disease. This is transmitted by the black-legged tick, but babesiosis, anaplasmosis, Poisson virus, and relapsing fever, black-legged tick only. So these are only transmitted by black-legged tick. Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia, only, uh, the, the American dog tick here only transmits these. It does not transmit these. And then you've got this lone star tick, which can transmit Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Tularemia, Starry, Ehrlichiosis, and Alpha Gal Allergy. So the overlap is really only in these and only with these two species. But having that species, knowing if you were bit by this black-legged tick or deer tick, can really kind of rule out these diseases. Or if you were bit by one of these ticks, can really rule out things like Lyme disease. So it's really good to know that species. And having that species in a bag, it, 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 you can show the doctor, you're like, I was bit by a deer tick, and they're like, well, I don't know, Where are, they? Do they are, they, are they an entomologist? Did they actually really identify that? You can show them, like, hey, doc, look, it was a deer tick. And they can say for sure, okay, yeah, I agree with you, it was, it was a deer tick. Um, and you can also get the tick tested. So this is a little bit contentious, but it can add some peace of mind. So the first reason you would want to do this um, is if you found a tick on your body and it had fed for a long time, um, if that tick comes back positive for two different diseases. So here you've got the, the agent that causes Lyme disease, and here you have the agent that causes babesiosis. And these diseases are actually treated with different medications. So if you were to go into your doctor's office and say, I had a tick bite, and you didn't have one of these reports, that doctor may only be looking for Lyme. And at a woman at her age here at 79, this babesiosis can be fatal if it goes undiagnosed or land her in her butt in the hospital. It's a, it's, you can think of it a little bit like malaria. It attacks your red blood cells, so you can quickly become anemic from this disease. Um, 
And this, but this report, one of the reasons why it's contentious is because this doesn't mean that this woman has these diseases. So she could, it just means that this tick had those diseases and that she might have been exposed to them. So it doesn't guarantee that. But it might put these diseases on the radar of a doctor who might not be looking out for these. So it's kind of nice to know that. The other reason to get the tick tested is what if the tick comes back negative? So this was a two-year-old boy, that tick was pulled off. We know, like, with tick, the tick testing done through tick report, they run negative controls, they run quality controls, sorry. And so the chances of a false negative is pretty much slim to none. Um, so you can pretty much rest assured that this particular tick didn't have any of these negative diseases. Some other kinds of tick testing, they may not run quality controls, and you could get a false negative, so another reason why it's a little contentious. And this also doesn't assess if there was another tick on that boy. So anyone who let this tick stay for that long on a two-year-old boy, maybe there was another tick that they didn't get tested that was also on that two-year-old boy. So it doesn't rule that out, but it's kind of nice knowing if that was the only tick on that boy, that that tick came back negative. That would be peace of mind in my book from, from my two-year-old. Um, and last, uh, I, kinda, I want you to photograph the bite. So I, I talked a little bit about a story um, earlier on uh, before people had started coming about a man that I had known who had gotten Lyme disease here in New England. It, he was cured of Lyme disease. Then he was visiting some relatives in Arizona, had gotten bit by a tick in Arizona while he was visiting relatives for a few weeks. Um, got a bullseye rash, went to that physician there, and that physician says, no, it's impossible. We don't have Lyme disease here. And he fought. He, he said he pushed for it. And eventually, that physician emailed a colleague in, in New England, and the colleague says, no, that guy's right. You, that, that's a bullseye rash. And you can see how that could happen. I mean, this is a bullseye rash here. It looks like the, tar the symbol for target. Um, but this is also a bullseye rash down here. And if a physician's not familiar with it, maybe they might miss that. Um, so that's one reason to do it, is so you can, you have this photographic evidence that if you weren't as pushy as that guy in Arizona, that you could then have that photograph and bring it to another physician. And what if that changed between the time you booked with physicians, you're like, doc, I swear I had it, and now it's gone, at least you have the photograph. And we've got cameras on our phones now all the time, we can take pictures. Uh, but it also helps the doctor as well. So if I went to a doctor and I said I had a bullseye rash, that doctor's like, what do you, you know, what do you know? But if I show him a picture and he's familiar or she's familiar, then she can make that medically qualified opinion on that photo. It helps both parties. You can't really lose by taking that picture. And I would actually take multiple pictures. I would take that picture right after the tick bit, maybe a week later, a week later, a week later, and just kind of follow and taking a picture every week just to see how that changes. Because the uh, bullseye rash bitten from a tick usually does change or usually does expand over time. And this gets into kind of the realm that is not my wheelhouse because this gets into the more medical side of things. So what it is is that the, the, the rash is actually a skin infection with the disease. And so that rash, they call it an erythema migrans, migrans because it expands. And so that can sometimes start out as just like a, a small something, maybe uh, less than an inch, and expand out to maybe eight inches. So that's what we see sometimes not all the time, and not all cases of Lyme disease will have that. You ask some people and they'll say 30% of people that have Lyme disease get the rash, and other people will say 90% of people who have Lyme disease get the rash. What is it, what is it? <laughs> you know, is it 30% or not? That's a pretty broad range in my opinion, but the bottom line for that is that it doesn't happen all the time. If you do get that, if it does look like that target symbol, consider yourself really lucky because that's a clear diagnosis that nothing else looks like that. You never, there's no other tick-borne diseases that will have that clear uh, erythema migrans. Um, Starry is something that kind of make looks, kind of has something that maybe looks like that, but it's not spread through the deer tick. So the bottom line. Um, if we aren't protecting ourselves, who will? You know, there's a lot, you know, tick-borne diseases are on the rise. Doesn't really seem like the government or anyone else is really doing stuff. You know, we have mosquito control. We don't have tick control uh, being sprayed. Uh, but th with the right knowledge and awareness, all tick-borne diseases are preventable. So, like I said, the science there is there to back up that all these methods do work and can provide you with a very, very high degree of protection. Sure. Yeah.